two definitions of the word education. First of all, activities that impart knowledge or skill. Activities that impart knowledge or skill. And then second, the gradual process of acquiring knowledge or getting knowledge. And so you think about education as that which is designed to get, let you grow in information, knowledge, let you grow in skill or the ability to do, but something that you can see from that second definition that happens over time. And we sometimes think that, that uh, uh, time is not involved in the education process. Uh, for example, uh, if you were to take a university course and you were only to listen to the material uh, or only to consider the material one or two hours a week, how long would it take you to, to, uh, to get through that university program? If you only studied and only considered that one or two hours a week, well, it would take you many, many years to finish that university program, and at the end of it, you probably would have forgotten most of it. Now, the reason I say that is because sometimes we think that education can take place only in church, and that if we come to church faithfully, we will educate ourselves in the Bible. You know, if you were to compare the number of hours that your child has spent in school, or even that maybe you spent in school, and compare those with worship, do you realize that to get a high school, or at least this is what we call it, a high school, I think form five maybe here, uh, to get that, that kind of education that takes place over 12 years usually in a child's life, to get that same education in the church just by a number of hours, it would actually take you about uh, 50 years, 50 years to get what a child gets in 12 years. Can you see that what happens here at church is only one small part of education, or at least it should be, because it is the process of imparting knowledge, it's the process of gaining skill, but it happens over time, and it only happens through repeated exposure. If we only expose ourselves to the gospel one or two or maybe three hours a week, then we are going to walk away from that and not know very much, which is not what God would want us to do. And I'm going to give you three reasons why education is important before we actually open up the book of Nehemiah and then we consider what it says about the idea of education. All right, education is important because we as Christians are concerned with learning. What made those, and this is a Bible class so you can answer me, uh, what made those people in Berea more noble or better in terms of their mindset than those in Thessalonica? Do you know? They searched the scriptures daily. Now, that would have actually... I want you to think about what that actually means. That would have been very inconvenient. Do you realize that? Because we think search the scriptures daily means they went home and they opened up their personal copy of the Bible. Do you realize that in those days, many people did not have personal copies of the Bible? In fact, most did not. And what searching the scripture meant was that they would have to go to the Jewish synagogue and they would have to ask to borrow the scroll. And oftentimes... One book of the Bible would fit on one big scroll, and you would have to actually unroll the scroll to find the place where you wanted to actually study from. It would have been a labor-intensive process, whereas we have our own copy of the Bible, and we can very easily open it up and very easily read it. It was very difficult for them. And yet they searched the Scriptures daily, and it made them very noble in the eyes of God. It made them to be uh, looked upon better by the inspired writer Luke. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says that we are to be diligent or we are to study to show ourselves approved to God. In order to be workers who are not ashamed, the goal that we have in approaching the Word of God, as it says there, is to rightly divide the Word of Truth. To rightly divide the Word of Truth. And what that actually means is to cut a straight path through the word of truth. As we know from Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, it's possible to take the Bible and use it the wrong way, isn't it? Satan did so. He quoted scripture. And so if you're going to use the word of God properly, you have to be diligent. And that's why the King James translators actually said, study. Study to show yourself a proof to God. It takes time. It takes effort. And it's that effort and that time that God is looking for as we approach His book. In fact, the only way that we can grow in faith, the only way that our faith can be increased, 
is through the way that faith comes. How does faith come? Faith comes by, remember Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by, I can't hear you. Okay, hearing. <laughs> faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. And so we have to be concerned with education because we are to be concerned with learning. The second reason why education is important is because there are things that we have to do. Remember, education is the process of imparting skill and gaining knowledge. Well, along those lines, there are things that we need to be knowledgeable and skillful in, and there are things that we need to totally avoid. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, there are a number of passages I could use to, to prove this point. But this one passage makes it very clear that His servants are to whom we obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so we have things that we must do in order to be obedient to God and things that we must avoid. Well, how do you know what to do? And how do you know what to avoid? There's only one way. And it's through the Word of God. If you don't study the Scriptures, if you don't educate yourself in the Word of God, you won't know what to do. Your conscience, your feelings, are not a reliable guide. We know that when people in Bible times, like Saul, for example, was persecuting Christians and doing something very, very wrong, he actually was doing so with a clean conscience. He thought he was doing the right thing, but it was, in fact, the wrong thing. The third reason why education is important is because like Jesus, we are to be coming to or rather to be, we are to be becoming more like Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, that those who are justified, that those who are sanctified, are those who are conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, our lives have to look more like Christ every day. The only way we can look like Christ is if we learn from Christ. If we don't examine Him, if we don't see Him through the pages of Scripture, then we will never know what He was like. The world paints a picture of Jesus that is distorted. Uh, we don't know from the world what Jesus looks like. We only know what He looks like from this book. And if we don't educate ourselves in this book, then we'll never know. And so God expects us to be knowledgeable in the Scriptures. We have some things that we must do and some things that we must avoid and ultimately, we're trying to be more like Jesus. And these are three good reasons why we should be very concerned with education. Now, as you think about being concerned with education, in other words, being concerned with growing in your knowledge, growing in your skill, and doing so over time, how can we revive that stone of education? Well, from Nehemiah chapter 8, we're going to be looking at three things, three things that were revived or brought back to life to reinstitute or to recreate the idea of education among the Jews. The first thing that we see is that there has to be a required text. A required text. Now, required text, have you ever gone and taken a university course before? When you get, uh, before I take my university courses, I get a syllabus. And uh, this syllabus, I don't know where that word came from. I don't like that word necessarily, but it's a piece of paper that says what you need to do and what you have to have. And so you look at this piece of paper, and there will be several required textbooks, things that you have to go, and you usually have to spend a lot of money to buy these books, and then sometimes the teacher doesn't even use the books. <laughs> so, but you have these books now, and uh, they, they fill up your, your, uh, your bookshelf. <laughs> and uh, in Singapore, they turn mold. <laughs> So, uh, but you have in these university courses required texts, required readings. Well, what is the required text as it relates to uh, us? Well, it's the same as it was in Nehemiah's day. Nehemiah chapter 8, if you'll open your Bibles there and examine with me in verse number 1. It says in Nehemiah chapter 8, all the people gathered themselves together as one man. What's that saying? They're, they're all unified in their desire to do something. To do what? They gathered themselves together like one man in unity into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And so they wanted to have the, the book, the law of Moses brought before them and read it. Now, 
to gain an appreciation for what it is exactly that they're going to be reading here. The law of Moses is not the entire Old Testament, because as you know, the book of Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. The law of Moses is the first five books of the Bible. And so what it is that they're wanting to study on this occasion is the first five books of the Bible. And the reason that I point that out is because I want you to realize that what we're talking about in this chapter, the excitement that you see, the desire that you see, is about reading Genesis through Deuteronomy. There are a number of people who begin a daily Bible reading program. And they read through the book of Genesis, and that's pretty cool, exciting, interesting stories. You come to Exodus, and it begins well, but then you get to chapter 20, and there are all these laws. And you read through, and there's all these sacrifices, which you don't get. And all of these names, when you get to, especially gets discouraging when you get to Numbers. And a lot of people will stop their daily Bible reading program when they get to the book of Numbers. And, and, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, but what I'm saying is I want you to consider the attitude that you have towards God's book. And when you see this, what we're about to see in Nehemiah chapter 8, how excited they are, how interested they are, how dedicated they are, when they're only listening to the first five books of the Bible, which are books that we usually don't like to study from. And so the problem really isn't with the information in these books. The problem is sometimes with our attitude as we approach both these books and the rest of the Bible. You know, and we'll talk more about this later, as we listen to the Bible, as we read the Bible, I'm actually a person who's a, against the daily Bible reading uh, schedule. And I'll tell you why. Because we don't need to read the Bible out of duty or out of responsibility. We need to read for understanding. We need to spend time. And if we, if we read only maybe five verses in a day, but we well understand those five verses, then that's good. I'd rather, as Paul said, speak five words with understanding than a thousand words that I don't understand. I'd rather read five words that I understand than be able to read a thousand words that I don't understand. And so these people are desiring to learn. They're spending the time that it takes to appreciate. Because when you do, when you do spend time with even these first five books of the Bible, even those books like Numbers, you'll realize that there are actually some rich lessons in these books, some powerful lessons that you can take to heart. And so they're reading the Bible. That's their required text. But even more specifically, they are reading the first five books of the Bible. As Christians, we need to require more of ourselves and of our children regarding Bible learning. I, I think that we need to be serious about this, and I am serious about this. I know what it takes for myself. You know, I'm a person who, who needs to have assignments and needs to have things that are... I need to have some kind of pressure to make me do things. I like pressure. I like being told to do things. And so to continue my Bible studies, I've, I've chosen to do so through a formal way. I'm going uh, right now to Free Part of Houston University, and I'm attending classes through uh, online instruction. Now that costs money because the degree that I'm getting is an accredited degree. But there are non-accredited programs that are out there. Brother Ron Gilbert will come next time, and he'll talk to you about a non-accredited program offered by members of the church that gives you an opportunity to study in a formal way. Now, however you do it, however you go about this process. We need to be requiring of ourselves and requiring of our children an education in the Word of God and using the Bible as our required text. We can think sometimes that when we read books outside of the Bible that we are actually using Bible study program. Uh, we saw, uh, it wasn't chicken soup for the, the people, what was it called? A Cup of Comfort. And there are these kinds of books, Chicken Soup for the Soul, A Cup of Comfort, these kind of books, these self-help books that they, that they were selling this in the, in the mall in, in Kale. Uh, and uh, these books have a little bit of Bible scripture in them. And sometimes people read those books and they say, ah, that makes me feel so nice. And uh, they think that that's, that's done well uh, in terms of their Bible study. Well, we need to actually spend time in God's book and see what it says. Learn for understanding in fact, we ought to be asking questions of ourselves and questions of our children. There's a congregation that every Sunday night in the U.S., they, they have the kids come to the front. 
and uh, all the kids come and they ask those kids a number of Bible questions and they're, they're learning the Bible slowly, slowly. But then every Sunday they close with two questions. And what are those two questions? They say to those kids, what is the measure of true success? What is the measure of true success? And the kids answer, go into heaven. That's the measure of true success. And until we're convinced that nothing else matters as much as that, uh, we're not going to require the Bible as much as we should. That's not going to be our required textbook. We're going to look to other things. The measure of true success is going to heaven. The second question they ask is, what is the measure of failure? And the measure of failure, they don't, the little kids don't say going to hell, they say not going to heaven. <laughs> but, uh, but we can say very plainly in this adult class that the measure of failure is going to hell. Uh, we, we don't want to go there. And so we need to require the Bible of ourselves. What if, what is the one thing that can keep us from heaven if ignored? In other words, if we ignore it, what's the one thing that can keep us from heaven? Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 6. All kinds of people around the world say this book differently. I said Hosea, you might hear Hosea, you might hear any number of different kinds of things, so never mind. H-O-S-E-A, it's in the Old Testament, chapter 4 and verse number 6. <coughs> My people are destroyed. Can you see why? My people are destroyed. Why? What is it? You mouth it out. Are you brave enough to say it? Come on. Lack of knowledge. Okay. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so, what's going to keep us from heaven? Not knowing what God wants us to do, not spending time in His book, will actually keep us from, from knowing. And so, if we reject the knowledge of God, notice what it goes on to say, I will also reject you. And so, second question is, where uh, can, what will, I don't know, that's not a good question. <laughs> where can we find what will get us into heaven? Uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. Even those of us who speak English don't speak English very well, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, but the word of the Lord is where we find the knowledge that will get us into heaven. Chapter 4 and verse number 1. Now the second thing that we need to think about as we think about education is that education can be revived when there is a respected teacher. Or in other words, when there is someone who is doing things that are worthy of respect. There are many people who don't take their position seriously. Realize that every person here in this audience is a teacher in one way or the other. And we'll talk about that later, how you are a teacher. But as we think about this, Nehemiah did not lead the revival of education among the people of Israel. A man named Ezra actually did this. Now, as we think about Ezra, let's read about him in the first couple of verses here of Nehemiah chapter 8 and also verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. All the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra, and that was the Ezra the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord God commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the, the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Verse 4, And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, kind of maybe like this one, and uh, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood, uh, not the Bible, there's a bunch of names there, and we'll leave that off. All right. <laughs> so, what we, as we look at this passage, we notice that there's a few descriptions of Ezra. First of all, Ezra is a Levite. What that means is that his ancestry is from the tribe of Levi. But what that also means is more than that. When you begin to consider the tribe of Levi from the Bible standpoint, those are people who are priests. That is his, that is his occupation, so to speak. The tribe of Levi were people who were separated unto God for priestly service. And so Ezra was a priest. Uh, in the Old Testament system. The second thing that we see to describe him is that he is a scribe. 
he is a scribe. Now the word scribe actually referred to what he actually did as a priest. A scribe actually was a person who copied the law of God. In other words, what they would do is they would take the old copies of the Bible. In those days, they didn't have the printing press and, or, or modern printers. And so they had to take the Bible and copy it word for word, letter for letter, into new copies when the old ones would get too old. And so people named scribes or called scribes were the ones who did this. And because they had to be very careful in copying, these scribes became people who were very well familiar with the law of God. In fact, as Ezra took up this position uh, as a scribe, he actually prepared himself for it. If we go to Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10, we consider the attitude that he approached his teaching with. Ezra chapter 7, if you just turn a few pages back, Ezra comes before Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10. It says, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel the statutes and judgments. And I love that order, the order that he approached teaching. Before he taught, what did he do? He prepared his heart. He prepared his heart to receive the law, to seek the law, it says, first of all. And after seeking the law, in other words, taking it into his heart, what did he want to do before he taught it? Well, he prepared his heart to seek the law of God, and then second, to do it. And so he saw it, he did it, and then he taught it. And that has to be the order for us as well. We need to seek it, we need to do it, and then we need to teach it. Any other order will not cause us to be respected. As we said, people are not looking at what we're saying, they're looking at what we're doing. So that's what Ezra realized about himself. As you think about this man, we need to also think about the fact that we also should be teachers. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12 is a very powerful passage for us as Christians because it reminds us of the fact that we are to grow into teachers. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. It says, for when the time that you ought to be teachers, the word ought, O-U-G-H-T, means you should be. In other words, that's what you're supposed to be. All right, you're supposed to be teachers. But he says, the time has come that you should, or you're supposed to be teachers. But then it says, you have need that one would teach you again the first principles. The first principles of the oracles are of the prophets of God. And so these are people that he's talking to who should have studied, for example, the law of Moses. And they should have studied the Old Testament, the oracles, the prophets of God. But uh, they've forgotten all of those things. Have you ever met someone who's been a Christian for 20, 30 years, and they can't even tell you the names of the books of the Bible? We found out at camp that some people didn't know the names of the books of the Bible after 20 or 30 years as a Christian. Is that good? I know that there are 66 of them. But uh, as you think about this Bible, this is going to really surprise you. The English Bible, if you were to read it from cover to cover out loud, to read the English Bible from cover to cover out loud takes 72 hours. That's three days. Three days and you've read the entire Bible. That kind of shames you a bit, isn't it? Uh, it, it puts you to shame when you think, oh, wow, this book is so big and we can't learn it uh, very easily. Well, actually, we could read it in three days if we would sit down and do that. I mean, I know we would have to sleep, but maybe a week. If we wanted to sit down and read the Bible in a week, we could do that. And now, as you think about that, though, how many of us have, for example, holes in our understanding? In other words, I'm talking about gaps where we don't understand certain parts of Scripture. We skipped over them. We've never given them any attention. I teach at 4C some of those gap books, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. The Minor Prophets, for example, 12 books of the Bible that people don't study because they don't understand the relevance or the importance, but they're very powerful lessons out of those books. Books like the, the, uh, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I find it very sad uh, in this part of the world that uh, you are a people who love Proverbs. In fact, I know this because I hear many Chinese preachers, and they will say, we have a saying, ching chong, ching chong chong. And then 
And then everyone will go, ah, yes. And, and we'll be sitting there, and actually, Brother Kwan likes to do this when I'm in the audience. He likes to use those things, and he says, Brother Swain, you don't understand. <laughs> and I'll say, yes, but he won't explain. <laughs> and so, uh, you all love Proverbs. But what if we could use God's Proverbs instead? Do you know that there is a book of Proverbs? A very rich book of Proverbs. Proverbs that if you reflect on them, they have so much depth and so much value, so much wisdom for practical daily living. And yet we ignore that book. Not a lot of preaching or teaching comes from the book of Proverbs, at least in the congregations that I've been to. Maybe you also. Book of Ecclesiastes, we just finished that. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is a very wonderful book of wisdom. Uh, it's written by an old man who wants you to avoid mistakes that he made in his life. And so there's a lot to be learned there, but we often skip over these books because we look at the title, Ecclesiastes, and we can't say it. We go, <laughs> I had a brother in East Tennessee who uh, I was doing, I had him do a scripture reading for me from the book of Ecclesiastes. And he said, Patrick, how do you say that book? And I said, Ecclesiastes. And he said, <laughs> And he got up there and did the scripture reading. Open up your Bibles to the book of Aminian. <laughs> he just never could get that. And so a lot of people skip over it because they don't understand what it is. There's powerful lessons in there. We are not all going to be public teachers. In fact, James said that not many should be public teachers because of the power of the tongue and the ability to lead people astray. But all of us should be personal workers. We find that the early church, both men and women, were scattered abroad and they were evangelizing. They were telling the good news, not publicly, but privately. Men and women were preaching the word of God privately to individuals talking to their friends, talking to their neighbors, helping them towards Christ. You can't teach what, as Ezra showed us, you haven't prepared your heart to seek and to do. And so early Christians sought the law, they did the law, and they taught the law. And that's what we should do today. That's really what we should also be doing today. Nehemiah wasn't a teacher, but he still helped in that process. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 9. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9. Nehemiah, which is... The Tershatha, or the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people. And so Nehemiah is there involved in the teaching, even though Ezra is the one who is leading in that teaching. Now, education needs a required text. That's the Bible. Education needs a respected teacher. That's you and me. And education also needs a receptive throng. Now that's preacher talk because I'm using alliteration, which is something we like to do. But receptive throng means a crowd that listens, an audience that listens. And so we have to actually educate ourselves in listening. Why? Because listening, surprisingly, is not natural. Hearing is natural. But listening is not natural. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 15. Now notice as Jesus is talking to the people, he says, This people's heart is waxed gross. King James Version says that, but it means that the heart is full of fat. And so it's not beating properly not talking about the literal heart, the spiritual heart, not beating properly, full of fat. Their ears are dull of hearing. Are they going, huh? What? I can't hear you, Jesus. No, they can hear fine. But the problem is that they're not really listening. Uh, their ears, it says, are dull of hearing. Their eyes, spiritually speaking, they have closed. Hopefully this morning none of you will close your eyes literally. <laughs> person already is. <laughs> and so their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and here's what it's all about, understand with their heart. We don't understand with the muscle that pumps blood, but we do understand with our spiritual heart. 
And so as you think about this, I want to put two things up here, here that you need to understand about listening. Hearing does not equal listening. How many husbands have you been watching a sporting game and your, your, your wife tells you to do something and you go, uh-huh, yes dear, uh-huh, yes dear. <laughs> and, 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 you, and then she says later, hey, why didn't you take out the trash? Oh, uh, I didn't know I was supposed to. I told you. Well, you were at that moment hearing, but you weren't really listening. And we can do that with God's book. I, I, I love to do this at 4C. We'll read a verse of scripture, and I'll ask the kids a question. I call them the kids, even though they're my age. But uh, I ask the kids, what does this, what, I ask a simple question based upon what they just read. And I have a lot of fun with, because they, 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 they invent answers. Victor, Victor remembers this. I would say, don't invent an answer. And, and, and he would do it too. He would invent answers, just pull answers out of the air. And I'd say, just take it from the verse that we just read. The problem was that they had heard, but they hadn't listened. They hadn't taken it to heart. And also along these lines, reading does not equal study. Along the lines of reading or listening, I like to tell a story about my grandfather. My grandfather was a good man at heart, but at the same time uh, had some habits not so good. Uh, he told me once, and it was in the earlier part of the year, that he had already been through the Bible twice that year. And I was like, okay, uh, that, that's very good. But then I came to realize what going through the Bible meant for my grandpa. My grandpa would uh, get up in the morning and he had the Bible on cassette tape. And he would put his cassette tape in and press play. And then he would walk away to the kitchen. <laughs> and he'd go to the kitchen and he would, he would fry his eggs. He would fry his bacon. He would pour his glass of orange juice. He would make his toast every morning, same, always. Eggs, bacon, toast, uh, and orange juice. Every morning. And he lived to his 80s, all right? So... It's, it's not about what you eat all the time. I don't understand it. But anyway, he, he, uh, he comes back. He sits on his chair. The Bible's still playing. Alexander Scoresby in that mighty deep bass voice reading the scriptures powerfully. And so he's, he's sitting there. And my grandfather was a diabetic. And if you know anything about diabetes, I'm not so smart to drink a big glass of orange juice. But he always had to have his big glass of orange juice. And so he would drink his big glass of orange juice, and then what happens to diabetics when they do that? He would fall asleep. He would just absolutely pass out. And meanwhile, Alexander Scoresby is still reading the Bible. <laughs> and so, at the close of all this, the tape would go click, you know, because the old cassette tapes, that's what they do when they're finished, click. And then he'd go, all right, done with the Bible. So he had, he had read the Bible for that, or studied the Bible for that morning. And so what was he doing? Well, he was listening, obviously, but he wasn't really, he was hearing, but he wasn't listening. So don't do like my grandfather, okay? Don't, don't do like that. When you study the Bible, make sure that you're free from distractions. Give yourself a period of time where you're truly going to listen. And what are you going to do as you listen? I want us to take some advice from Nehemiah chapter 8 about this audience that you see here. First of all, notice how they listen respectfully. Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 5 and 6, they listen respectfully. It says in verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. He's standing kind of on a podium like I am. And when he opened it, now notice this, all the people stood up. Why did they stand up? It's the opposite in those days. Do you realize this? The teacher would sit down. The audience would stand up. I like that better. <laughs> you know, I wonder why we don't have that system. Uh, they, they would actually stand up. And you really begin to appreciate this when you realize that they studied the Bible for hours on end. All day long. They're standing up and listening to someone like me just talking to them. There's no PowerPoint. There's no air con. All right? And so you're just listening to the Word of God all day long. Now that's reverence, isn't it? They, 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 sh they saw the importance of it, and so they stood up. We stand up for prayers because we're respecting God, but we don't necessarily stand up when we're studying the Bible. I'm not saying that you have to, 
but in your heart you should be standing up. In, on Sunday morning, boy, you need to have sleep, all right? The night before, not during Sunday morning, okay? And you can get up Sunday morning and be ready. You need to drink some coffee, okay? Uh, make sure you're wide awake and you're ready to take in God's book respectfully. You see the importance of it, the value of it. In verse number 6, we also see then that Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. All the people answered and said, Amen, Amen. They're paying attention and they're saying, I agree, I agree. That's what the word Amen means. With lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Notice that in listening to the Word of God, they're worshiping. How many of us approach the act of worship called preaching as though at that time we're actually worshiping God? And if so, would God be happy with our worship at that moment? You know, when, when you uh, are, are listening to that preaching and you begin to see two of me, you know what I'm talking about? You get sleepy, you start seeing two, and then you start, you're nodding, but it's not because you agree. You're doing that number. You're, you're, you're going, as I say, to the land of Nod. The land of Nod. That's where Cain went, isn't it? We don't want to go to the land of Nod. All right? Uh, that's not reverence. We're not treating it like it's an action of worship. During the preaching part of the sermon, I'm not the only one who's worshiping. All right? You also are worshiping through how you listen and how you take in what God has to say through His book. Not through me, but through His book. Now, they listened also patiently. And as we can see, they're standing in verse 5. How long were they standing? Well, he uh, in verse number 8, they uh, read, I believe verse number 9 is what I'm looking for. It says, Ezra the priest, the scribe, the Levites, had taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people uh, wept when they heard this law. And uh, I'm still not getting what I'm looking for here. Uh, all right. All the people in verse 7 stood in their place. Now, I'm trying to find that passage. I didn't write down the right reference. I apologize for that. I'm losing my respect as a teacher at the moment. But <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the passage does make reference to the fact that they were listening all day long. I can't remember exactly the reference. and I'm not seeing it as I look briefly over. But anyway, they were listening quite patiently. They were also listening attentively. In other words, they were really listening to what they, uh, what they were hearing. They trying to really take it in and see what can I do with it. In verse number 3 it says, The ears of all the people, at the close of that verse it says, Oh, here's where it says, uh, And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. So you got the picture? That's probably about uh, seven or eight hours of listening to the Bible. Just someone speaking. Wow, it's a lot, isn't it? But they, they listened from the morning until midday. And as they did so, notice it says, The ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. They were, they were listening attentively. They were focused on those words and trying their best to understand them. They also listened agreeingly. They said in verse number 6, Amen, Amen. They were listening to the point where they were saying, All right, I understand and I agree. You know, it's not improper, even though it doesn't happen very often, during preaching and teaching for you to say amen. I've been to some congregations before, and it's very encouraging where people do that. Uh, but in many congregations in this part of the world, in Australia, and even in the U.S., uh, that, that custom is being lost, where people, they're not paying attention, so they can't say amen. <laughs> they don't know when. Now, don't be like, there's, there's some people that I've, I've been to before, uh, some congregations I've been to before, where uh, the, the people will just say amen to everything. That's not so good. <laughs> Uh, we, we, were, uh, we were at a campaign once, and we were preaching in a church in, in Florida, and uh, there were these old men in the front, and just every sentence the preacher said, they said, Amen! Amen! <laughs> and, and it got to where the preacher didn't want to hear that, and so he just started talking faster. <laughs> so they couldn't, and they go, hey, oh, hey, oh. They're trying to get their Amen in there, but they couldn't do it. So, uh, just... Timely amen. When you really agree with something, you say, Amen, I agree with that. They listen humbly. Notice in verse number 6 how they're bowing their heads, how they're lifting up their hands. They're, they're, they're doing that. This is the posture of respect for the Jews. 
They were saying, you know like how a little kid does. A little kid, what do they do? They come up to you and they reach up to you like this. Well, uh, that's the way that they did when they when they worshipped to God. They would reach up their hands, but because they respected God so much, they wouldn't look up, they would look down. And so that's the posture, actually, that they took. And uh, I'm not saying that we have to recreate that posture or do that today, but in our heart, what should we be doing? Well, we should be listening humbly before our God, bowing our heads in our, in our, and inside of ourselves and saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do that. They listened joyously. I like this point in verse 10. It said, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet. Nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry. You see, the people wanted, were very sad when they were reading the Bible because they began to realize, verse 9, that they weren't doing what God had asked them to do. And so the, the teachers all say, This is not a day to be sad. I know that, that you are sad because of what you haven't done, but be happy because of what you can do. And so they listen joyously, and he tells them to be encouraged about that in that regard. And so they all did that. They went, he spilled the people, hold your, hold your peace, verse 11, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And so they ate, and they drank, and they were happy, because they were studying the Bible once again. And then they listened obediently. In verses 13 through 17, you actually see them beginning to do what the law of God says. And I find this very interesting. I'm not going to read all of this passage to you, but I'll summarize what happens. In verses 13 through 17, as they're studying the Old Testament, they come across this feast that they've not been keeping for all these many years called the Feast of the Booths or the Feast of the Tabernacles. And what this is, is the reason they haven't been keeping it because it's not a convenient feast. You actually, in order to keep it, you actually go and you have to stay in a tent for seven days. How many of you would like that? Go camp on, camp on for uh, uh, seven days. Not so nice. <laughs> but they would do that as a part of their obedience to God because God wanted them to understand that the houses that they had did not come from their own effort. They came from God. And to appreciate the fact that they used to have to live in tents. And so they did that for seven days. And so they, they were looking for things to obey. That's the attitude that we should approach the Word of God with. And then they listened repeatedly. In verse 18, we find that they did that day by day. They kept on listening to the book of the law of God. As we close out this morning, we are always learning. We are always becoming something. So the question is, what are you becoming? Are you growing in your knowledge of the scriptures? Are you growing to be more like God every day? Can you say at the end of this month, for example, that I know more now than I knew at the beginning? If I look back at the end of this year, do I know more now than I knew at the beginning of the year? We should be growing in our education, abiding that stone in our hearts and in our lives. God wants us to learn His Word and become Christians. And so my goal for you is to increase your study habits. I don't want you to necessarily tie yourself to a daily Bible reading program. If that's what works for you, then okay. But I want you to just maybe, I would rather you say that, for example, for the book of April, for April I want to, to spend some time and understand the book of Matthew. Just sit down with that, that one book and say, during this month, I'm going to come away from the, this month with a good understanding of this book. That would be a good use of your time, I think. And then if you do that over the course of a few years, you can go through the entire Bible that way, just focusing on one book at a time. That's what it takes. Patience and perseverance in Bible study. Thank you for your attention this morning.